Okay, welcome to Green Infrastructure, Climate and Cities. Um, this is a seminar series that has been going on now. We're going into our third year. Um, it's a collaboration uh, from a number of organizations. For those of you who are joining us online for the first time, including uh, the Consortium for Climate Ra Risks in the Urban Northeast and a variety of other partners that you see here. And just for those of you, again, who are joining us, um, it was originally a 13-part series. It's now become a 14-part series, and we're likely going to be continuing. So stay tuned. Probably next month, we'll have a calendar going forward into 20, um, 2018 of speakers. I know uh, at this point, we're good to go through uh, November of 2017, and then uh, we're lining up speakers for uh, beyond that. So the series will not end uh, in October, as shown here. But we are in uh, of the original 13 uh, parts of this original seminar series, we're in number 12, uh, focusing on the extremes. And again, the series is called um, Green Infrastructure, Climate and, and Cities. And we have one to three speakers per month, depending on the topic, uh, with the opportunity for questions and answers and webcast, uh, simultaneous webcasting and archiving of the, of the talks. Um, so today we, um, Focus, with our focus on the urban northeast, we've got uh, two great speakers um, covering New York and Philadelphia. So our first speaker will be Alan Cohn, who's the Managing Director of Integrated Water Management and is now involved in water conservation for the New York City Department of Environmental Protection. And he'll tell us about um, New York City's um, efforts at looking at extremes, and which is a, a germane topic given what we've been experiencing and are experiencing right now. And then our second speaker, Carol Collier, who is at the Academy of Natural Sciences here at Drexel, but was formerly the executive director of uh, DVRBC, the Delaware River Basin Commission. And she'll be talking about Delaware River issues. So we'll start with Alan. We'll do some, um, some questions and answers. And um, those of you attending online, feel free to type in to the bar your questions and we'll, ask the, we'll pose the questions to the speaker. So thanks, Alan. On wherever you want. Is this you? Uh, Where's no. your talk? This PDF. Okay. Here we go. Okay. Yeah, there you go. Oops. All right. I will get started. Um, so, thank you, Franco. Um, as uh, as I was introduced already, uh, I'm the managing director of um, Integrated Water Management at the New York City Department of Environmental Protection. I focus on climate resiliency as well as water conservation. Um, and as the slides are coming up, I'll just talk a little bit about um, New York City Department of Environmental Protection. Um, that was, that was we're the largest question. combined it's water and wastewater utility in the United States. Um, we have about 6, 000, over 6,000 employees oh. and an annual budget of more than $1 billion. We're responsible for New York City's water no, supply, wastewater here. systems, and stormwater management. Um, we deliver no, almost one billion this one. gallons of water per day um, to nine million New Yorkers, well, actually, including we, how, customers in the communities. In and PDF we maintain PDF? seven thousand miles this of water mains. File. Um, yeah. It protects know, approximately two thousand square miles of watershed, including nineteen yeah. reservoirs and three controlled lakes. Um, you'll hear, be hearing more uh, about our water supply um, as well from from Carol uh, after me. Um, on the wastewater treatment side. We treat almost uh, 1.3 billion gallons per day. Um, we operate and maintain 14 wastewater treatment plants, um, 96 pumping stations, and over 70, uh, 7,500 miles of sewers. Um, we are also responsible as the Department of Environmental Protection um, for air, noise, and hazardous waste, um, enforcing the New York City uh, Air Pollution Code. Um, to reduce local emissions, um, enforcing uh, the noise code, and uh, regulating hazardous waste. Um, but I'm going to focus uh, mostly on those first two, um, which are uh, waste, which are water supply, wastewater, and our stormwater management system, which um, brings uh, runoff um, from streets to the wastewater treatment system. So I'm going to give a broad overview today um, of our. Uh, climate change risks as it pertains to these systems, and um, really try to focus upon what we're doing now to enhance resiliency. Um, so based upon what we know, uh, we've already taken um, numerous measures, um, some of it 
regardless of climate change, these are things that water utilities have to uh, think about um, anyway, drought, um, heavy rain events, flooding, etc. Um, these are really part of the fabric of, um, of water utilities. Um, the question is how do we operate in the future? How do we adapt infrastructure um, to changing conditions? How will uh, droughts change? How will floods change, etc. Et and so um, I'll first talk about our water supply system. Um, where really uh, the focus is precipitation, whether it's too much or too little. Um, I'll also talk about uh, our wastewater system, um, touch upon uh, extreme heat, um, which is not something we think about as much when it comes to uh, water supply, um, or in wastewater rather. Um, the wastewater system is also affected by coastal flooding as we saw in um, Hurricane Sandy. And stormwater um, is coming into increased focus. Um, green infrastructure is in the name of uh, the seminar series. Um, it's some, a topic that has uh, seen a lot of focus in the past um, couple years. Um, but increasingly, we're looking at how does green infrastructure function in the face of climate change? Um, and we saw uh, Hurricane Harvey just last week. Um, the questions you know, that we're receiving are what are the capacities of these types of systems to handle the extremes and not just um, the everyday rain events. So the supply, um, the New York City water supply is a vast system. It's comprised of three watersheds. Um, again, you might hear a little bit more details about this um, in Carol's presentation. Um, on the left uh, side, you see the three watersheds, the Catskill and Delaware system, um, on the, in the um, uh, east, um, or rather west of Hudson watershed, and the uh, uh, Croton system, which is our oldest system um, in the uh, east of Hudson uh, watershed. Um, the drinking water uh, travels through an extensive network of aqueducts and tunnels, um, some dating back more than 150 years, um, flowing largely by gravity, um, so it's very uh, low greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and traveling um, from sources that extend as much as 125 miles um, from the city. Um, on the right, you see um, our in-city um, uh, tunnel system. And one of the features that you'll notice is that we have a lot of redundancy. Um, we're in the process of building out uh, the third water tunnel. Um, so this idea that if something goes wrong, you have a backup is really key to um, how we operate um, you know, normally, and not just in the face of climate change, but it also becomes a um, climate resiliency uh, measure. Um, because it's such a large uh, system, um, in the wake of uh, storms and droughts that cause disruption to one part of the system, we're, able, we're often able to draw from other parts of the system um, so we can maintain an uninterrupted flow of potable water. So the first thing that people think about um, typically when it comes to uh, water and extremes is drought. Um, we are, for the most part, a very water-rich area. Um, however, we are uh, subject to a periodical drought. Um, this is the Cannonsville Reservoir um, in 2001. But as I mentioned, because we have such an extensive system, this is just one of the reservoirs we're able to pull from other reservoirs in times like this. Um, <clears throat> although precipitation is expected to uh, increase going forward, the city does need to analyze um, drought patterns and changes in temperature as well. Um, changes in temperature can lead to decreased snowpack and longer growing seasons um, that could reduce the availability of water to refill reservoirs to meet summer demand. Um, we not only need to meet the city's drinking water needs, um, but our responsibilities extend beyond the city boundaries. Um, we divert or release water from the system um, to communities outside the city. We maintain flow in the Delaware River. Uh, we support fishery and habitats and recreation. We generate electricity. Um, and increasingly, uh, we've been uh, enhancing flood mitigation provided by dams to downstream communities. So there's a lot of um, factors that we have to consider in the operations of our water supply system. So shifting straight into what are we doing to ensure that we have a resilient system. Um, one of the most straightforward uh, things that we can do is reduce 
the demand on the system. Um, this graph shows the population increase in green um, compared to the demand um, in blue. And you'll see that despite an increase in population, which number is now over eight and a half million people, um, our demand is down to about a billion gallons per day. Um, this is actually lower um, than 1966, which was our drought of record. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, we're really seeing this continue to drop, and particularly the per capita um, use continue to drop, um, which is good for uh, enhancing our resiliency to, to future drought. Um, the temporary demand reduction um, you see in 1966 um, is, is one of the measures we take uh, to, um, to enhance uh, our, our resiliency to drought in the, in the moment. But permanent savings, um, like the ones that we've now achieved, uh, are, are really important um, so that we're uh, resilient next time a drought hits us. We have to reduce our temporary uh, savings less so. Um, the way that we've achieved this is through metering, um, for one thing. Uh, before metering, we didn't really know exactly where our water was going and how much was going where. Um, that awareness um, and the, the cost signal has led to a decrease in per capita demand. We also have uh, robust uh, retrofit programs, a toilet rebate program that ran from 1994 to 1997. Um, led to a dramatic uh, savings in water, and we now reinstated that program in 2014. Um, and overall uh, improvements in the efficiency of, of the new building stock is also important. So we continue to drive down demand um, through system optimization and fixture placements um, at schools and public facilities, um, as well as residential buildings, and I'll just talk a little bit more about that. This is just one example of uh, the ways that we're bringing down demand. Um, this is a spray shower at uh, one of our New York City playgrounds. Um, we're working in partnership with the uh, Parks Department um, and we implement <coughs> uh, playground spray showers that conserve water during high demand summer months um, by ensuring that the, the, the showers are only activated um, while in use. Um, without timers and reactivation buttons, uh, playground showers use approximately uh, 5,600 gallons of water per day. Um, timers can reduce that by 50% or approximately 2,800 gallons per day. Um, so just last month we announced that 400 spray showers have been upgraded, uh, reducing citywide water consumption by over a million gallons per day. Um, this is just, again, one example of sort of the pretty simple things that you can do, um, especially when you think outside the box of what you know a, a water utility typically does. You have to consider partnerships with other city agencies and um, ways that you can uh, you know not just maintain your infrastructure and fix your infrastructure, but actually bring down um, your demands and uh, enhance your sustainability. Another example, uh, way, one way that we're working with the residential sector sector is through our water um, reuse grant program. Um, other cities are doing this. Uh, San Francisco, um, for one, is doing this in the face of uh, some of the concerns with regards to drought. Um, what we do is offer private property owners um, capital funding to implement a system that essentially takes uh, you know, used water from flushing, from showers, from cooling and recycles it um, into uh, those systems. Um, you don't need to use potable water, drinking water um, for flushing a toilet. Um, so why not treat it on site, uh, bring it back into the building and reduce the amount of uh, potable water you're taking from the city systems. Um, so this is something we just rolled out at the end of uh, last year. Um, and we're hoping to um, promote uh, more buildings to implement them. Uh, the picture you see here is from the Solaire, which is uh, in Battery Park City. It was one of the first buildings in New York City to implement, um, and we understand that there's about 20 uh, similar buildings, uh, or similar systems, rather, um, at this point. So that's just focusing on bringing down our demand um, in the face of, of drought and other um, impairments to our system. Um, but we have uh, most of the issues that we see with regards to water supply and climate change or that we anticipate seeing are a factor of uh, heavy rain events, um, or at least we anticipate that the heavy rain events that we will increasingly see in the future are going to continue to stress our system like we've seen in the recent past. 
Um, heavy rain events like in 2011 with Hurricane Irene um, caused high pathogen and contaminant levels in our reservoirs. Um, they increase turbidity, um, how cloudy the water is um, from uh, sediment from, from nearby soils. Again, our water supply has enough flexibility. This isn't necessarily true of everybody's, every water system, but New York City is very lucky that our water supply system has enough flexibility um, that we're typ typically able to withdraw from other parts of the system when this happens. So this doesn't happen in all three watersheds the same. Um, there's different geology in some of this uh, reservoirs so that uh, some reservoirs are affected more than others. Um, and so typically we're able to uh, draw upon um, other parts of the system when one part of the system is um, affected. So the worst example we have of this, I mentioned in, uh, on the drought side, our, our drought of record, so the worst example we have in recent history is, um, is the 1960s drought. On the turbidity side, our worst example is from 2011. Um, in late August, we had Tropical Storm Irene, which dumped 16 inches of rain um, in some parts of the New York City watershed. And then just two weeks later, or 10 days later rather, um, we had Tropical Storm Lee, um, which produced more heavy rain. Um, we maintained, we managed to maintain an adequate water supply um, this entire time. Um, but it, uh, resulted in our longest treatment system, uh, treatment regime rather, um, that, that we've ever seen. We had to treat our uh, system um, for 260 days in a row. Um, usually we require um, no treatment. Um, and that's the type of thing which we want to avoid in the future. We have um, a filtration avoidance termination, um, which we're very proud of, uh, meaning we don't have to build a filtration facility for the Catskill and Delaware systems. Um, that is something that we really want to protect and when you have these types of events that are causing us to have to treat um, temporarily, um, you really start to wonder whether um, these uh, you know, events are going to um, affect our ability to maintain an unfiltered system. So as part of that um, filtration avoidance, uh, really our first line of defense is our natural systems. Uh, maintaining natural conditions around our reservoirs um, supports really high quality water. Um, the Catskill and Delaware uh, watersheds are 75% forested. Um, and again, since the um, early 1990s, um, we've maintained legal status um, that we don't have to build a filtration system uh, because of the quality of the water produced by these watersheds. There are just natural solutions. Um, you're always going to have to, especially when you're thinking about the extremes, um, seek out the green solutions, but ultimately you're going to need what we call gray solutions, so your typical infrastructure fixes. Um, what that means in terms of a water supply, um, one example rather, is um, enhancing the redundancy and the flexibility um, through interconnections, um, like the uh, shaft four interconnection. Um, it allows us to reduce flow from the Ashokan Reservoir. Um, this is a reservoir that is particularly prone to turbidity. Um, so when turbidity is elevated in the Ashokan Reservoir, um, we can reduce flow from that particular reservoir um, while still maintaining sufficient uh, flow um, to meet uh, water system demand. Um, this increases our operational flexibility, um, so it reduces turbidity entering our system, improving water quality. Um, as we continue to make fixes like this, um, it really allows us to uh, tap into the flexibility that's already built into the system. And finally, on the water supply side, um, I just want to mention the, uh, what I'm calling operational intelligence. Um, so the more that we can understand our system, the more we can make smarter decisions. Um, in the past uh, decade or so, um, we rolled out a system called the Operations Support Tool. Um, and what this does is it takes current data about reservoir levels and water quality um, and incorporates uh, forecast weather conditions and river and stream flows. Um, it merges data to check and confirm um, quality and then it simulates uh, water supply operation scenarios. Um, so that gives us the projections to determine how we can operate um, the system in different uh, scenarios. That's useful in both in the near term, um, 
managing day-to-day -day operations when we have anticipated <coughs> weather events, but also capacity to make longer-term decisions. Um, for instance, we can look at uh, climate change and whether uh, the operational decisions tapping into flexibility in the system will allow us to be um, resilient in the face of, of the types of changes that we anticipate. Um, so I think with that, I'm going to shift over to the wastewater system. Um, and I've already given a high level overview of, of wastewater. Um, this shows our 14 wastewater treatment areas. So those uh, polygons represent the drainage areas um, for the 14 wastewater treatment plants. The picture on the uh, top right is an example of one of our wastewater treatment plants at the Newtown uh, Creek wastewater treatment plant. Those are the digester eggs um, that process sludge and um, create uh, methane as a byproduct, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, and this is our uh, CSO facility. One of our CSO facilities, CSO is a combined sewer overflow. Um, so the treatment plants have limited capacity. And in a heavy rain event, what happens um, is that the system has relief mechanisms that some of the sewage, um, instead of backing up um, into people's homes and overwhelming the treatment plants, spills directly into the harbor. What the combined sewer overflow facilities, this one is hidden under a soccer field, does is it captures some of that flow and then pumps it back to the wastewater treatment plant after, um, after the storm has subsided. So I mentioned before that the water supply system is very, is gravity fed and therefore uses very little energy. That's not the case for the wastewater treatment system. This is an extremely energy intensive system. And as we continue to build additional facilities like combined sewer uh, overflow facilities, um, that continues to increase our energy footprint, our greenhouse gas footprint. Um, that in turn can result in um, strain on the, uh, on the electric grid, um, particularly in high heat events. Um, so I'm t I've talked mostly about flooding and high precipitation and coastal, um, and, and, and coastal uh, flooding in a second. Um, but when there's a high heat event, um, in the past we've seen blackouts and brownouts that have caused uh, wastewater to spill untreated or partially treated sewage into the harbor. Um, we do have um, uh, generators in place to help avoid that, um, but since 2013, um, DP has been playing an active role um, in the demand response program um, with the state and the city. Um, during a, a heat wave, uh, we'll be called upon to actually reduce uh, our demands um, and thereby mitigate the risk citywide um, of, of blackouts and brownouts. Um, so that's one way we sort of mitigate risk temporarily, but in the longer term, um, we're also looking to reduce our energy demand with systems like solar panels. Um, on the top left, uh, you can see the um, Port Richmond solar array. Um, it's a 1.25 megawatt system. Um, and can supply as much of the, as a third of the electricity needed during daylight um, at that particular facility. Um, two of our other treatment plants uh, beneficially use some of the gas that's produced on site um, for both heating um, and electricity. And at the Newtown Creek um, wastewater treatment plant, which I showed in one of my previous slides, um, we're actually taking food scraps um, and using it to supplement the amount of gas that's being produced by that facility, and then putting that back, cleaning it up, and putting it back into the natural gas grid. Um, that's being distributed to the um, surrounding community. Um, so again, all these things are you know, taking demand off of the system, um, but they're also reducing our energy um, and greenhouse gas footprint. So <clears throat> the perhaps most stark example of um, what we might see more of in the future um, was not surprisingly from Hurricane Sandy. Um, beyond uh, posing a citywide risk um, for uh, storm surge and sea level rise, um, our facilities in particular are, are at risk. All 14 of them are located directly on the waterfront by design. It's the lowest point, um, so it can receive the majority of the flow by gravity. It also allows you to bring in ships to ship out the sludge. So that's not something you can necessarily just relocate. Um, they're there by design. Um, 
but as a result of that, during Sandy, um, 10 out of the 14 waste, wastewater treatment plants were damaged um, or lost power and released untreated or partially treated sewage into local waterways. Um, three of the facilities uh, were non-operational for some time, um, two for several hours, um, and one down for, for three days. Um, some of the facilities in uh, New Jersey and Long Island fared a lot worse than us um, and uh, released a lot of untreated sewage um, into the harbor. Uh, we estimate that our contribution to that untreated sewage was approximately 560 million gallons of untreated sewage uh, mixed with rainwater um, and seawater. So this is something we take very seriously. Um, as sea level continues to rise, um, coastal storms will cause more flooding um, over a larger area and at increased heights. Um, you know, Hurricane Sandy itself, uh, about a foot of that flooding was attributed to sea level rise since uh, 1900. Um, so as we continue to see um, increased uh, sea level, um, we anticipate that this risk will only become worse. So one of the first things we did um, after Hurricane Sandy, um, very straightforward, we adopted a design standard that any facilities being built or modified um, here on out should plan for coastal flooding and sea level rise. Um, we adopted the 100-year storm um, base flood elevation plus 30 inches of um, sea level rise, which is uh, at a high-end projection for, for the middle of the century. Um, just this year, uh, the mayor's office um, released citywide guidance on uh, designing to incorporate uh, sea level rise and recommended that we use uh, 40 inches that also incorporates um, freeboard and then an additional safety factor. So that's something um, we've now included in our revised design guidelines. And the map on the right <coughs> shows the coastal flooding um, at various levels. Uh, in blue, that's just the the current 100-year floodplain, um, and the orange and red um, show that that is going to increase beyond that area, um, but you're going to see an increase in flood heights um, all throughout that area. The green represents our wastewater treatment plants, and the yellow represents uh, our pumping stations. So a lot of it, as you can see, is in low-lying areas and near the coast. So we couldn't just say, um, you know, we'll protect uh, whatever um, new projects we have, um, but we also wanted to look at our existing infrastructure and what would we need to do to protect it um, and retrofit it. So <clears throat> we looked at all of our facilities below a certain threshold, that 100 year flood plus 30 inches. And we performed a risk analysis, um, looking at critical ways that um, flood could get, flood waters could get in them. Um, we found that at le uh, that all of our um, wastewater treatment plants are at least some part in, in, at risk, and 60% of our pumping stations are at risk. Um, and then we didn't just leave it at that. Um, we performed an adaptation analysis to see what measures we can take um, to protect them. So the result is a portfolio of strategies, um, including elevating and floodproofing critical equipment. Um, for the most critical assets, we chose the most protective strategy regardless of cost, um, whereas for less critical assets, we saw a strategy that balanced cost and protection. Um, and the plan showed that by investing over just over $315 million, the large amount, in flood protection, we could protect over $1 billion um, in damage. If you look at the cumulative avoided damages over 50 years, so the repeated flooding losses, uh, from uh, numerous storms uh, coming in over 50 years, we estimate that you can avoid over two and a half billion dollars in damage. Um, so this is really important to us um, in terms of making the business case um, for uh, investing. Um, this is not, you know, money that's necessarily easy to come by, um, and we've successfully um, been able to uh, receive um, about 160 million dollars so far um, from post Sandy relief efforts. So finally, um, with the last few minutes, I'm going to talk about um, stormwater. Um, green infrastructure shown here um, is a, an additional buffer on top of the, uh, of the, the drainage system, the sewer system. Um, so our traditional drainage systems uh, comprised of uh, sewers and a few pumps um, are designed to handle uh, just under two inches of, of rain per hour. 
Um, even then, our system can be overwhelmed, as I mentioned before. Um, it causes sewage, can cause sewage to spill into the harbor um, or flooding to occur in low-lying areas. Um, and as such, in addition to those uh, larger facilities that we've been building to manage combined sewer overflow, a few years ago we started to supplement the sewer system by capturing the first inch of uh, rainfall runoff and letting it infiltrate into the ground. Um, through our green infrastructure program, we've formed important partnerships. Uh, that's one of the key themes. Uh, we can't just work alone as, as a water utility. Um, on the top left, that shows uh, the rain gardens that we're implementing um, with the uh, Department of Transportation um, in the sidewalks. They essentially divert runoff from the street, let it sink into underground space below the, the, the tree pit. Um, and then if the tree pit uh, fills up, there's an there's a outlet on the other side that lets it go back into the sewer. Um, likewise, we're working with the park department on the Green Streets program, um, and that shows a larger rain garden that bumps out into the street on the top right. Uh, our grant program uh, helps private property owners. The example shown here is the rooftop farm um, in the Brooklyn Navy Yard, I believe. Um, <coughs> And then public property uh, retrofits also include um, schools. So this is a playground, which, which was a, a you know, typical asphalt um, covered up. Uh, and we took that, we helped fund this project that made it a more attractive space, but also um, reduces the stormwater that's running off of the property. So, what sewer, what sewer systems and, and green infrastructure systems are, are not typically um, built to handle is this. Um, this is not New York. Um, this is Copenhagen. Um, and we just saw last week um, Harvey um, uh, on a much different level than, than what they saw in Copenhagen. But we're starting to think more and more how do we handle these extreme events. Um, in 2011, Copenhagen's event um, <coughs> Uh, resulted in um, close to a billion uh, dollars in damage. Um, they had six inches of rain in two hours. Um, for New York City, it's not a matter of um, if, but when we're going to see something. Uh, maybe not on the, on the same uh, level as, as Harvey, but maybe something similar to what they saw in, uh, in Copenhagen. We've already had some close calls, as I mentioned before, with uh, Tropical Storm Irene and the 16 inches of rain dropped just north of the city. In August 2014, Long Island had um, over 13 inches of rain um, in just in less than 24 hours. So it's coming close, um, closer and closer, and we recognize this risk and have to start um, preparing for it. Um, so one of the things that we're doing is looking at how other cities are responding. Um, and following Copenhagen's uh, what they call a cloudburst event, um, they developed a cloudburst management plan um, which set a uh, strategy of using green infrastructure um, and, and typical um, pipe gray infrastructure to manage these larger events. Um, shown here is the city's uh, first water plaza. Um, it doesn't look too different than New York City's green infrastructure with one key difference. Um, you can see on the right, uh, there's a retention basin um, that's designed to fill with water during intense rain events. Um, Currently, Copenhagen is working towards implementation of 300 projects like the one shown here to manage extreme rain events. Um, so since 2015, we've actually been working with Copenhagen um, to exchange ideas. We want to understand how can more effective and extensive green infrastructure supplement the sewer system, um, and how can we target high-risk areas. Copenhagen's example isn't the only one. Um, this is uh, the so-called water square from Rotterdam in the Netherlands. Um, it's a series of three basins. Uh, the first two fill up um, during an everyday typical rain event. Um, this third one uh, only fills up during an extreme event. Um, so most of the time it's dry and it can be used for recreational purposes. Um, the school next door plays basketball here. The church next door has baptisms there on Sundays occasionally. And so <clears throat> this idea of using urban space and modifying urban space to deal with flooding is something that is um, catching on um, in more and more places. And the principle behind it is that your um, sewer system um, will only help manage rain up to a point. Typically, um, it's about a five-year storm um, is the norm. You can't just 
dig up what you have in the ground and start over again. Um, so you need to decide, you know, what, how do you use your, your streets, how do you use your parks, um, and instead of flooding any flooding, regardless of what you do, you really want to try to think about how you can uh, flood by design um, and see where water goes and try to route it in ways that minimize damage. Um, even then, there's always going to be a larger storm. No matter what threshold you choose, um, there's going to be a storm that exceeds it. So you always have to think about protecting um, property, particularly in low-lying areas. So we started to um, test out these concepts um, based on Copenhagen's approach um, in New York. Uh, we did a pilot study in Southeast Queens, which is an area that has chronic flooding. Um, we looked at how flood water would flow um, using modeling and how we can better manage it. Um, we look at the underlying conditions, where there's green space um, that can provide opportunities for, for flood management. Um, and then we look at how we can implement strategies that will slow and convey um, flood water that will mitigate impacts on the community. When you first, um, when you develop your, your, your flow maps um, showing what would happen in an extreme event, you, you get these flow lines um, in green, uh, which when you compare to the historical maps, uh, closely follow where there used to be streams and wetlands. Um, we're not going to be able to recreate those streams and wetlands necessarily, but what we can do is look at modifying um, the flow um, where it would go and, and see if you can work within the context of the city um, to reroute it. Um, we use a couple of uh, strategies to, to do this, including green infrastructure to um, slow um, water, as well as new strategies like recontouring streets and creating um, retention areas so that you can direct flow away from um, the streets and into those larger storage spaces. And so at a conceptual level, what we've come up with um, for this part of New York City and Southeast Queens is a network. Um, in green, you see uh, the gr typical green infrastructure, ways to slow down water. Um, in blue, um, it's uh, areas and streets that would re uh, convey water and um, areas that would store water um, above ground. Um, and where possible, we sought to align these corridors with other opportunities to enhance community c connectivity. Uh, for instance, you can align your, your street improvements with a, with a new bike path, and that's something that's very big in Copenhagen, so we tested that out in, in New York as well. Um, and <clears throat> we looked at um, you know, the result of, of implementing this network um, and incorporated them into a hydraulic model. Um, the flooded areas were translated to a heat map of potential risks to property and, and infrastructure. And what you see, <clears throat> what you see here is that you could potentially um, reduce the risks um, to property and infrastructure by implementing this network of green infrastructure. So, while this is being implemented um, full steam ahead in, in Copenhagen, uh, we're still sort of in the proof of concept phase in New York. Um, and what we're doing, instead of implementing the whole network right away, is we're do, um, doing a couple of pilot projects. Um, the first is at South Jamaica Houses, um, operated by the New York City Housing Authority. Um, and just as an example, um, this shows a green space um, that is underutilized, and while it's green, it doesn't really hold too much water. Um, you can take a space like this and similar to many of the other green infrastructure examples, you can transform it into something like, uh, that is uh, more actively used. Um, this has a strong gardening community and you could have a space um, that can redirect water um, but also be used uh, during dry periods for, for uh, more active uses. And the idea um, is that uh, in an extreme rain event, it can flood safely. Um, it might flood anyway, but this is being flooded by design. Um, and if we're looking to Copenhagen for inspiration, flooding becomes this happy thing with ducks <laughs> instead of a, a, a nuisance to the community. Um, so the concepts are really promising. Um, we've already set the foundation uh, for a lot of um, uh, for a lot of this through, through our partnerships, our green infrastructure program, um, and I, with just uh, you know, some, some slight tweaks, um, this might be something that we could um, use also to offset some of the flood risks to the city from heavy rain events. 
So I'm just showing um, this slide from, from the beginning, um, again in summary. Um, but with that, uh, I think we have a few minutes left and I can take any questions. Questions from? Um, you were talking about methane mm -hmm. uh, generated by the treatment plants, uh, uh, treatment plants, and I wanted to have you talk more about how you might um, reduce methane and other um, greenhouse gases in your system, or how you thought about that whole thing. I know you said some of it's being recaptured and directed in different ways. So the question is about um, capturing methane um, and, and reducing methane emissions from our, um, from our facilities. Uh, where possible, we are taking it and using it on site um, for what we call co-generation. Um, so that is heat and electricity um, to, make, to operate the boilers um, that, uh, that are used for, for wastewater treatment at that particular facility. Um, so that's the primary uh, use um, that is an alternative to traditional flaring, where we just burn it and it turns into carbon dioxide. Um, so that's happening at uh, two, now two going on three facilities, and then the fourth facility that's capturing um, the methane, uh, enhancing it with the food scraps and feeding it back into the grid. Um, so it, that's about four facilities that we're doing it right now, right, right now but that's something that we hope to grow in the future. Do you have other um, sort of examples or other No, just that? a concern about, about that. Yeah. There's different ways that you might be lessening even the production of it to not have to reca uh, recapture it. I don't know too much about any efforts to reduce um, methane production. Um, it is a byproduct of the treatment process, as, as you probably know. Um, it's not to say that there isn't some work that, that the agency is doing, so I can find out about that. Are there any online questions? Good. I, just, I would ask one quick question. Just the uh, operations uh, tool that you have for the water supply system that deals with the forecasts and then makes decisions about, is there any um, talk about doing that with your sewer system? So as to, like, I mean, oh, I know there's some cities have, have sort of played with inflatable dams and things like that inside the sewer system to sort of maximize the storage of water in the sewer system. Is, is New York City thinking about that at all, or is that not feasible? It's a good question. So um, if we're looking at a, a more sort of intelligent um, operating system for, for our sewers, um, for the most part, it's a much more passive system, so it's not being done to the same extent, or as far as I know, there's no plan to do that to the same extent that it's being done um, for uh, the water supply system. Um, I know that there is some hesitancy to put too much in the way of real-time controls um, into the sewer system because more can go wrong if that system doesn't function as designed. Um, so I think we're, we're building up our, you know, our monitoring capacity. Um, there is a potential to do, um, to do more of that in the future, and I, I think it's a direction um, that we might uh, want to pursue when it comes to like, flood management. Um, but at this point, we're not doing too much. <coughs> Um, I thought learning from the COVID project example was really interesting. Are there any um, considerations of public health risks from like standing water that might remain in yeah. the structures that you need to Yeah, so the question was uh, public health risks from standing water um, from the like, example from Copenhagen. And yeah, I would say that's that and maintenance are the two concerns that we hear the most, um, particularly when we um, propose it to um, some of the other agencies that would actually have to own these systems. Um, and Copenhagen's response has been that the systems that they've designed um, in Rotterdam, I believe as well, um, drain down uh, in 24 or, or 48 hours. Um, so if we you know, pursue this path, um, that's something that we, that we want to um, that, that we definitely want to consider. There are, um, it's not just the, the standing water, so the concerns 
about mosquitoes, but also the safety concerns um, for my kids falling into it um, that we would have to overcome. Um, so we need to, uh, that, that's one of the big reasons that we're doing um, the pilot projects is because we need to think about those issues that we might not otherwise consider um, by doing. And if we go full steam ahead and implement this citywide, um, we might not foresee some of those issues coming up. Quick brief in the weeds. At one point in one of the slides, you said there was a difference between what Copenhagen was doing in New York City, and there was a picture of maybe a basin with a pipe coming out. What was the difference? Um, not if I'm recalling. Okay, yeah. it, was, it was as if Copenhagen, but not New York City, was using retention basins. Oh, sure. Yeah. Is that so the case? The, the question, yeah, the question is the, what is the difference between. Um, the way that we're designing the systems in New York versus how they're designing them in Copenhagen and Rotterdam and so forth. Um, and yeah, the primary difference right now um, is that the green infrastructure systems in New York are being designed only to capture the first inch um, and reduce combined sewer overflow. So that typically means that you can just capture it and let it sink into the ground. You don't have to provide that storage capacity like they're doing in Copenhagen. Um, that lets it uh, handle a, a larger volume and then slowly drain back into the system. So your system, while it maybe grabs less, perhaps it deals with that standing water issue. That's true. Yeah, the, I mean, really the infiltration-based systems, as far as I know, frankly, you might be able to correct me if I'm wrong, don't have too much of a concern when it comes to um, standing water. I think it might vary from system to system. Yeah, um, you, you can design you can design these systems with a slow release pipe, and so you would just scale that based on the size of the facility. So, um, but I do th that that's a standard way of designing these systems is that they don't hold water for more than like you said, 24, 48, or 72 hours. I think in Philadelphia, it's a, yeah, yeah. When you mentioned your resilience plan, re resiliency planning, uh, you uh, spoke of using the BFEs for existing floodplain maps, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we produced new floodplain maps for a, for a tributary watershed to the Delaware back in 2006 when I was at Temple University. And uh, I had to argue uh, not too forcefully, but uh, to be allowed to use the upper bound of the 90% confidence interval yeah. for the 1% storm. Yeah. And in our case, that was, of course, based on that was 14. Uh, and that figure was 8 and 3 quarters inches. Yeah. Uh, Atlas 14 was published in 2004 on data through 1999. Last year, I went back and uh, took uh, daily precip figures for our same area back through 1959. So I overlapped not only 1999, that is Atlas 14, but also TP40. And that 8.75 inches, I ran the annual maximum event series, and that 8.75 inches now should be something like 10 and a half inches. But the BFEs are unchanged because the floodplain maps are still based on those down 1990. The four greatest events since 1959 have happened since 1999. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so we're behind the curve, and if you're planning on using those BFEs, you're already behind the curve. What are we doing about that? So you're talking about the um, flood risk as it pertains to rainfall. Um, a lot of the work that we did um, post Sandy was trying to better characterize the flood risk as it pertains to coastal flooding. And um, there was this expedited effort to update the historical uh, maps so that what we're showing now is a 100 year flood based on the most up to date historical climatology. Um, New York City moving forward is going to use one set of maps that characterizes um, the existing risk, but then also develop, continue to develop rather, um, another set of maps, map that incorporates the, the future looking climate risk as well. Excellent. So that's just on the coastal protection, uh, coastal flooding uh, risk. But um, not on the rivering flooding. Not, we don't have rivering flooding as a major issue, but um, one of the things that we're concerned about, as I, as I mentioned, is, is the urban flooding, the, the rainfall risk. Um, 
as far as the new climate resilience design guidelines coming out of the mayor's office, office we did look at the most recent um, Atlas 14 rainfall projections, as well as um, some of the climate projections from uh, the Northeast Regional Climate Center at Cornell um, in terms of precipitation intensity, and that's actually reflected in the new climate resilience design guidelines coming out of the mayor's office. So that's a work in progress. Yeah, I mean, Cornell was uh, actually back when we were doing, I was trying to get to use their figures because they were already higher yeah. than, uh, than NOAA 14. Yeah. But uh, I wasn't allowed to. Right. Yeah. So it's a perfect segue into the question that I had about the 40 inches on, above the BFE. To what, in your new guidelines, so what properties will those be sort of uh, applied to? Is it just? So the 40 inches uh, above the BFE um, in the new climate resilience design guidelines um, pertains to uh, critical infrastructure. Um, so it's not just uh, wastewater treatment facilities. That's how. That's, that's how we're thinking about it, is, is how it pertains to wastewater treatment facilities. Um, but there's a list of, of other critical infrastructure assets. Um, and there's different thresholds based on time horizons. So whereas in the past we just selected you know, 2050s and we developed the um, uh, design guidelines based on that one threshold, uh, the design guidelines, um, which you can find online, Ask you to consider the um, the useful life of your um, of your asset, whether it's 2020s, 2050s, 2080s, or end of beyond that. And there's different thresholds for each level. Great, thanks. You have an online question? Yes, um, I think this question is asked asked by Bill Owen from Stevens Inst uh, Institution of Technology. He is asking that the DEP facilities uses 70 to 80 megawatts of power is it related to uh, the pumping mostly and can you talk more about the power requirements for it the question <coughs> about the uh, where the power um, needs are coming from uh, from at, at our facilities and uh, I believe as I mentioned before um, and, and I think it's in, the, in that question it's uh, almost exclusively wastewater treatment as opposed to water supply, which is mostly gravity driven. Um, and uh, it's pumping and treatment um, is, the, is the short answer. I don't know the details of, of you know, what part of the, of the treatment process, but it's mostly pumping at the, at the facility as opposed to citywide pumping um, against gravity um, and uh, primary and secondary treatment uh, of wastewater at the individual wastewater treatment plants. Okay, thanks, Alan. Sure. So our next speaker is Carol Collier from the Academy of Natural Sciences of Drexel University. Um, I guess uh, z will get your presentation. Yeah. Let's extend. Great, thanks, Kevin. How's everybody doing? What a great time of year to talk about extremes. Huh? <laughs> I was uh, just looking at the uh, hurricane uh, path before I got here, and it reminded me that when we first looked at Sandy projections, the path was straight up the Delaware. And I just can't imagine. Uh, what it would have been like as you see how the Delaware works, no dams, et cetera. Um, and now Irma looks like uh, she could be heading for us also. So what I want to talk about today is a little bit different. I mean, cities are doing incredible things within their cities, but it's hard for them sometimes to work outside their jurisdiction. And if you think about um, the older cities, Philadelphia, New York, even uh, ones up the river, they're at the lower parts of a watershed because they were riverborne commerce. You know, they're, they're confluences of major places. So they really are dependent on what happens upstream. So I want to talk about droughts and floods, what we need to look at at a larger watershed scale and what needs to be looked at locally. Um, and the fact that 
somehow we need to do a better job of educating people that they are part of a bigger system because that's uh, a really part of the problem. One, water management does not work on averages. We need to look at the extremes. That's also something hard to get across to people. It's only going to get worse, as we know from what Alan said and others. And so I want to talk about some existing management strategies and also how we can affect uh, local change. So here we are in Philadelphia, Delaware River, Schuylkill River. Four water intakes, one on the Delaware in the tidal part of the, door of the Delaware, that's the Baxter plant. Two over on the Schuylkill, that's in the non-tidal area. But here we are in the lower part of this whole <coughs> basin. And not only do we have 13,500 square miles of the basin, about 200 miles of stream upstream of us, but we also have the Schuylkill, which is the largest tributary to Delaware, also entering Philadelphia. And we have a series of smaller watersheds. So Philadelphia, and, and think other cities also, really can't control a lot of things that happen to them. They're really dependent on what their upstream neighbors are doing or not doing, both for droughts and floods. So you need to look at the basin. The other thing I wanted to mention, I don't know how much of uh, you've looked at the Delaware versus others, but one of the neat things about the Delaware is it is a totally shared river. Whenever you're standing on the bank of the Delaware, you're looking at another state. Just for comparison, Susquehanna to our west, I call a stacked watershed, starts in New York, uh, state boundary, runs through Pennsylvania, state boundary, Maryland. But with the Delaware, you've got to have shared management because the water is shared. So it complicates things. We have over 15 million people uh, dependent on the water. As Alan said, half of New York City, uh, and there are, about, there are over 8 million people in the basin itself. Longest Dundan River east of the Mississippi. Incredible recreation resource, but think of it in a flooding and drought context. And a very used river, 8.7 billion gallons used daily. A lot of that for thermoelectric, so it goes back. Uh, New York City use, using the water, the number one municipality. And unfortunately, I had to change this to a six. We used to be number five, but now we're the sixth largest metropolitan area. Um, because of that shared nature, President Kennedy signed into law in 1961 the Delaware River Basin uh, compact, creating the commission. It has five members, the governors of the four states and a general in the Corps of Engineers who represents the president. So the whole idea of this is to look on a watershed basis. Take your day hat off and say, what's good for the watershed? Don't look at the state boundaries. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But it's a way to manage. So I want to go through both droughts and floods sort of what the current management plan is, and then really hopefully have time for a dialogue on what we need to change. So as I mentioned, New York City reservoirs in the very headwaters, Philadelphia intake down in the tidal area, New York reservoirs, 271 billion gallons of water. If uh, you were um, mayors or governors when New York City decided to put those reservoirs in, would you be very happy about it? No. So, uh, you know, putting dams in the, in the upper part of the Delaware. So there were Supreme Court cases, 1961, determined by Oliver Wendell Holmes, reopened in 54 when they decided on the third reservoir, and there was an agreement made, Supreme Court decree. New York City could take 800 million gallons, up to 800 million gallons, out of the basin of New York City. Just by comparison, Philly uses about 300 million gallons. New Jersey also has uh, the DNR Canal. They take 100 million gallons out. But there's a flow gauge at Montague, right up by Port Jervis, where New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Delaware, uh, um, excuse me, New Jersey, New York, and Pennsylvania all come together. A flow has to be met there of 1750. That was determined by a low flow calculation, 0.5 CFS per square mile above it. And there is a river master. Uh, in USGS that um, uh, follows that. But there were issues about saltwater intrusion down, down in the lower parts. 
And then we had the droughts of the 1960s, multi-year drought. And there wasn't enough water to go around. If New York City took everything they were allowed to take, there wouldn't be enough water running down the river. And uh, this shows the Palmer Index. You can see in the 60s how dry it was in the mid-Atlantic uh, New England section of the country. Um, but when you look at the whole basin, there's not a fresh, enough fresh water coming down the river. Salt from the bay can come up the river. And uh, river, um, river miles start at the confluence. So river miles zero is where the Delaware hits the ocean. So the drinking water intake at Baxter is at river mile 110. Then Franklin Bridge is 100, just for comparison. During that drought of the 60s, the salt line, that's the uh, salt content and drinking water standards, 250 milligrams per liter, was up at 102 river miles, so only eight mile river dif difference in a 12 mile tidal excursion. It was really fun talking to reporters because they wanted to go up in helicopters and see the, this, this salt line. <laughs> <laughs> but you can see normally the salt line would be down here behind the uh, Delaware state line. So there's the whole yin and yang of managing the basin. And so Philadelphia cannot do this themselves. They got to work with others for that uh, freshwater flow. There was a lot of this. So what do you do? Um, how do you manage water when there's not enough to go around? Uh, do they go back to court, the Supreme Court? Or is there some other way? And luckily, DRBC had been created just in 61, so they used the offices of DRBC. I think they locked themselves in the Union League for about a week. And um, came out with something called the Good Faith Agreement. Now, the parties to the decree are different than the parties to the commission. Parties to the decree are the city of New York and the four states. Um, this was known as the Good Faith Agreement, and essentially it equalizes the hurt. So as it stops raining and the reservoirs st start going down, New York City takes less, the river gets less, New Jersey takes less, and it sort of equalizes it, and it's worked. Um, so there's a New York City plan I'll talk about, and there was also two reservoirs built, Beltsville and Blue Marsh. Beltsville is up off the Lehigh River, <coughs> Blue Marsh is on the Schuylkill, um, maintained and built and maintained by the Corps of Engineers, but DRBC actually owns water in those reservoirs, so it can call for storage and release. There's also a whole bunch of other reservoirs. Uh, privately held um, or state held, and they can be commandeered during droughts uh, to uh, be managed for um, protection. So this shows uh, the old operating curve for New York City reservoirs. People seen this before? Is this old hat or new hat? Okay. Um, this shows 271 billion gallons. That's like the total for all three reservoirs. The big blue line is what it is during the year. So it, you know, it goes down in the fall, up in the, the summer. And that magenta line is the existing. So this was back in 2001. It stopped raining May, June 2001. And as the waters go down in the reservoir, it crosses a drought watch, drought warning, and then a drought line. And at each of those, something else uh, is required of the city and others. City takes less, New Jersey takes less. So it gets down to regulating to uh, make sure that that salt doesn't get in Philadelphia intakes. There's some uh, issues with that right now that we can talk about. But the system works. This is a graph at uh, Trenton flow in the drought 1999. The black line shows what the real flow was. So this is 3,000 to 2,500 CFS, and that's where you want it during low flow to keep the salt down. The red is modeled that if the reservoirs weren't there and it was unregulated, <coughs> the flow would have been bouncing around below 1,000 to 500. So this whole system does work in a drought situation. It got more complicated. New York City reservoirs have relief structures from the bottom. 
So they release this really cold water. Who likes really cold water? Trout. And it's turned into a world-class trout fishery below the reservoirs in the upper basin. People from, come from Montana to fish in these areas. Um, so there's a whole new constituency. Fisher guides, motel owners, restaurant owners, etc., who want the system managed for them, for the fish, not just for water supply. When the Supreme Court um, looked at this, there were no conservation releases, there was no ecological flows, so it makes sense. And so the parties to the decree got back together again and came up with a flexible flow management plan. So while it conforms to the Supreme Court decree, there's more sort of micromanagement, if you will, to protect the fishery and also from a flooding perspective, reduce um, spill or mitigate for spills. And um, this, this is just pretty incredible because what the Supreme Court said is it has to be a unanimous vote. Think about negotiations for a unanimous vote versus a majority vote. Trying to get all those people, New York City and four governors, uh, their uh, um, uh, alternates, to come to a decision unanimously. It's a pretty difficult, and it, it was this past year. <laughs> so it's all about adaptive management. Supreme Court set a strict allocation. It didn't work, but we worked our way through it. And the parties meet annually, probably uh, actually more than annually, to look at what works, what has to be modified. And as long as there's a uh, unanimous agreement, um, it moves forward. There was a lot of modeling done. There's a, um, no, I just lost the name of it. What's the model for the river? You guys use too. Oasis. Uh, Oasis model for the whole river. And then USGS has a water model. It's like a top model. And so this flexible flow management plan addresses water supply issues, in-stream flow needs, and spill mitigation based on the reservoir releases. <coughs> Every year for the past five or six years, there has been agreement on May 31st to approve the plan and keep, keep it going with my minor modifications. This past year, there was not a unanimous vote, and one of the parties did not want it to go continue on an annual basis. They wanted a, a longer term, um, and it wasn't working. And so there is not a unanimous agreement right now. And if that happens, it goes back to what's called Rev 1, um, Revision 1, that is pretty draconian. It has much lower conservation releases. Mm -hmm. um, it has no spill mitigation, et cetera. And so there's a lot of meetings right now with those parties to try and come up with something that they can all agree to to get a unanimous agreement. Who upset the apple cart? <laughs> Come on. The, you're state, the state across the river. Who would have thought? Who would have thought? I know. <laughs> okay. So, what's the answer to a drought? A flood, right? That's how you end a drought. Um, it only takes about a month to go from a flood to a drought, but it takes a day to go from a drought to a flood. Uh, <laughs> happens very quickly. And it's one that I, I say is less managed in the Delaware Basin. This goes back to the Palmer map in uh, the 2000s. Uh, you can see we are in the wettest part of the nation. And we had three major floods between 2004 and 2006. Uh, this was on my watch. And um, there we were, the Delaware was always known as the droughty river. The Susquehanna got floods. But this changed all priorities. This shows um, from early 1900s to over 2000. This red line, you can say, is significant floods. So this is Delaware River at Trenton. Like a low flow number you want to maintain at 3,000 CFS. The red line is 175,000 CFS. So this is a toad choke. That's a, that's a technical term for a big storm. Um, so, uh, 1903, major storm, 1955, uh, storm of record, 
flood of records. <coughs> and then here are the three grouped. Almost 50 years, or it was 50 years, between these floods. So it was, it was not something we were dealing with. The governors got together and said they wanted an interstate task force. Um, it was really well done. There were six major categories, 45 recommendations, but a, not a lot of political willpower to enact them. A lot in flood warning, which I'll talk about. There were some really good floodplain regulations put together. They may still be on the DRDC web pages, but they were not enacted. Uh, floodplain mapping, the recommendations were to tighten up the standards, especially for the um, uh, floodway, to, to make that larger. That was not done. So it's, you know, it's what's science and what is uh, politics. But for flood warning, there's some neat stuff. No AHAPs, advanced hydrologic prediction system. This is great. You can just go out on the NOAA website. And it was originally for emergency managers, but people along the river use it all the time. And what it shows is, so this is Delaware River Trenton again on a Saturday in October. The solid line is what the flow is, or excuse me, the stage, the, uh, the height of the river. So it's eight feet going along. And then once it goes to the green, that's predictions. So that shows you that um, 2 o'clock on October 2nd, it's going to crest at 20.9 feet. Pretty neat stuff to have if you live close to that point in the river. But who knows, if you live on uh, Main Street and there's 20 feet, of river in the wa in the 20 feet of water in the river, do you know how much water is going to be at your house? Not so much, right? So the USGS NOAA and core of engineers worked together and did this inundation tool and it's this is also on the NOAA website. You can use your um, cursor and make a point that jump down here, say this is your house here and you can put in that it's 20 feet deep in the crest of the river and it will tell you how deep it's going to be at your house. It's really pretty cool. So that's out there, that's usable. And then I was just talking to Gary uh, Sikowski, who uh, was the lead forecaster at the Mount Holly uh, NOAA lab. And um, he's retired now, but he, he still does weather. And he showed me this. This is an um, ensemble forecasting that they do. This is also available to look at. So a whole number of models. So this is a river level simulation at the Schuylkill at Philadelphia uh, for right now. And this goes out a lot more uh, days than the AHAPS does. So that's what the uh, hydrologists use. So some neat tools um, available. DRBC put together a flood resources portal. So you can go there to look at the AHAPS and different issues for flooding. It's just drbc.net. And then they're, um, it's pretty easy to get through their, through their website. But to me, this is the problem. This is my poster child. And I think this is what we need to deal with more in the future. These are million dollar condos right below New Hope, behind the wing, below the wing dam. The Delaware Canal is here, the river is here. Yes, they are a foot over the 100 year floodplain. Or, um, but during this flood, there were propane tanks coming down the river you know, logs, everything else, hitting these, these houses. I mean, is that a place to build a house? Um, and the people, you know, were like, how, how was it allowed to be built here? You know, they were really panicked. So wh where do we, how do we work with townships when we're in a state, both on this side of the river and the other side of the river, that are local rule? You know, municipalities do land use. So how do we work with them for flood and drought situations. The other thing with land use, I love this map. <clears throat> so urban is red, ag is, is brown, and green is forest. We talk about green infrastructure. That's my green infrastructure <laughs> right there. Look at that. 81% forested in that upper basin. And if we can keep that 
think what a buffer that is for our urban area. The problem is the majority of that is privately held. So it can go any day. And I would say that a, a person representing the city of Philadelphia can go, not go up and knock on the door up there and say, oh, excuse me, sir, but your forest is really valuable to us. Will you promise not to develop it? It's not going to go over too well, right? So how do we show these people, one, that those forests are important to the local people up there, or have some kind of a financial model that the lower basin can support protecting the forests up there? Um, so top down, bottom up, you know, we think of silos for water, wastewater, storm, storm water, water supply. We need to think of them as one, right? Because there's only one water. Um, decision makers like black and white, like Alan was talking about the numbers, how he convinced uh, the powers to be for the wastewater plants. But with the uncertainty of climate change and this, you know, stationarity is dead, it's really hard to give that black and white answer decision wa makers want, so we've got to deal with that. Regulations are really important. Um, I've got point sources under that. Regulations are really good for point sources, for water allocation, et cetera. But when you're dealing with some of these issues, it's got to be more collaboration, education, you know, dealing with non-point sources, dealing with land use, and um, protecting the forest. So just different, different management schemes. One thing I wanted to mention that, that uh, I'm involved with, uh, it's headed up by Roland Wall that's in the back there, um, is this Delaware River Watershed Initiative. It was kick-started by the William Penn Foundation, and the purpose is to, to develop watersheds that provide sufficient clean water to support healthy, natural, and human communities. Pretty big goal. It's in the Delaware Basin. Um, backbone of science, but the whole idea is not like the Chesapeake Bay program where you're trying to get farmers up in the hills to change their ways so people can eat crabs in the Chesapeake. This is, why is your local stream special? Why is it important to make sure we limit agricultural runoff or suburban runoff? Or if it's really good that we protect, protect the forest? And if you have enough of these local projects, they build up and will protect downstream. So there's 50 organizations. There's been uh, a forested acreage uh, saved, a lot of ag and suburban protection. And what's really cool is people coming together and realizing that being part of this program, they can do something bigger. So maybe this is a whole other talk by itself. So how do you put all this, what's happening now, in context? And it's, it's really got to be cumulative. So we talk about the climate change issues, sea level rise we haven't talked about quite yet, but more intense storms, but we're still going to have summer droughts, so more in the extremes. The loss of snowpack. Snowpack is a water supplier's best friend because the water just soaks in gently, hopefully most of the time. But with the temperatures, we're going to lose a lot of that. But you've got to tie that with population shifts. It's great people are moving into the city, but we're also getting more people moving in the upper basin. What does that do to water supply, water demand? Uh, energy production has a water footprint we've got to watch. And then the ecological flows. Um, the Nature Conservancy has done the science for what flows need to stay in the river, for what level streams and seasons but it has not been put into effect yet. And one of the issues is, if you keep more flow in the river, there's less sustainable yield uh, for water supplies or water withdrawers. So how do, you, how do you balance that, especially when things get dry? Um, for the uh, seawater issues, the salt water, we know the, um, the water levels are going up. We know that sea level rise is going to be higher in the mid-Atlantic area than other parts of the globe, so we're going to have higher levels. And that takes us back to where we started with droughts and water supply in Philadelphia. So the two red dots 
or River Mile 110, the Baxter plant, and then there's a New Jersey American plant right opposite it, just a little bit up. And then this was a study done by University of Pennsylvania. It was just a, a design studio. It wasn't peer reviewed. But they used the drought of the 60s flow numbers with a one meter sea level rise. And said so with that, you could have the salt line four miles upstream of the water supply by 2050, seven miles by 2100. And now this was done a couple of years ago, so I'm sure it can be tightened up. But, but the fact is true, if it was at 102 just for the, um, for the drought of the 60s, when you add three feet of water um, to it, it's likely going to go up. So what the heck do we do with that? And um, that's one of my famous, I love that quote, especially being a planner. So how do we plan? So all these things have to be put together. How do we control this salt line? I mean, even if the, the uh, intakes were moved upstream, there's freshwater marshes, really unique tidal freshwater marshes. Uh, critters like the oysters, uh, their life histories need different salinity levels. There's a lot depends on that salt line. So what do we do? And then the other issues, future water demand. And the reservoirs, um, both for flood and uh, drinking water, so there's two different types of reservoirs. If we have more intense storms, they're not going to catch as much. They're going to spill more than if the water was, um, you know, precipitation was more even over the year. So how do we fit that into it? Do we need more water storage? What kind of water storage? How do we address that ecological flows versus the water human needs? And then um, flood reduction. And, and here, I'm talking more about what Alan was saying with the uh, Copenhagen uh, situation or just big basin storms, not, not what can be handled by the small green infrastructure work uh, that you know, is, is really necessary for small, but what do we do for the bigger stuff? And then, of course, the forest. Um, we need holistic strategies, and we need to look what's upstream doing to, down to, doing to downstream, and also what it had to downstream needs affect upstream use, and how do we do that in a uh, you know, sort of a team approach? Based on wide solutions and local, and then helping people understand, like the people in the, uh, those condos, it was sunny out when they got flooded. There was 15 inches of rain upstream, but the sun was out by the time they got it. They had no clue what was happening. And there was all kind of blames, et cetera, which is a whole other story. But it's people don't understand the, the systems part of it. Uh, DRBC is putting a strategy together looking at 2030 and 2060 using the IPCC scenarios as a base, uh, USGS for temperature, precipitation, et cetera, and then their water demand availability, uh, drought resilience work. So that's underway. City of Philadelphia has a whole adaptation program and looking at their watersheds work. But my, my question I want to, if we have time for discussion is, is how, how should we do this as a community? If we've really got to get the land use side of it as well as the basin scale, who do we need at the table? What, how should we be doing this so we have a resilience plan um, for the basin that protects us down here in Philadelphia? And I think that's it. I sort of ran through that because <laughs> I wanted to have two minutes before we left. <laughs> Questions for Carol? <clears throat> so I'm curious about legal stuff. Legal stuff? Legal stuff. So oh, where's my attorney? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you got no help. So, so you described a couple of court decisions and the compact, and then some planning that may be fracturing a little around the edges. And I guess what I'm curious about is, and you may have already covered this, but just to sort of bring it together, are you seeing sufficient differentiation of impacts from climate change, whether on the flooding side, yeah, we haven't seen drought, any drought anytime soon, but between climate change, sudden events, rise in sea level. 
will there be um, disparate impacts in the watershed such that there's more likely to be greater fracturing and of in interest among the states, among the relevant yeah. legal parties, such that it's going to get worse rather than better? <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> um, you know, it, it's... Can it, you repeat the question just for the people online? Oh, <laughs> repeat the question. <laughs> um, so the question was, it is the is the fracturing of, of activities among the states going to get worse? The states not coming together to collaborate as climate change uh, affects them differently? Is that okay? Um, I think one general problem with climate change is nobody wants to admit that any one event is due to climate change. And so you have, you know, a huge intense storms. We've got these hurricanes one after another. Well, there have been other years with hurricanes one after another. But when you add different things together, it makes sense that something's changing. But it's hard to get decision makers <laughs> to, to buy into that. You also have Delaware and New Jersey as estuary states, so they've, or parts of states, so they have really different issues than the upper basin states. Um, the other problem I saw too was that um, there's more states' rights feelings. I can do it myself. I don't want to work with my neighbor. But when you have a shared system like this, it's really hard to, to manage it without working with your neighbor. So I think there's a lot of things at work that are making it a lot tougher to manage natural resources overall. Yes? Uh, I know there's a person called the Delaware Water Keeper. There's a river keeper. River keeper, yeah. And there's a river master. And yeah. they're really and, different. And, oh, <laughs> could you describe some of what they do and how they might interact with some of the things that you're talking about? Sure. First, let me make a distinction. The river master was appointed by the Supreme Court, and he is the lead hydrologist at USGS. <coughs> and he is the one that is working with New York City and the parties uh, to make sure that flow target at Montague, the 1750, is, is met. The River Keeper Network is a nonprofit uh, organization, uh, advocacy or organization, looking to protect the quality and flows of the river. Um, you know, they care about the river. Other questions? I have a question. So you showed that operations curve that shows how the hurt is distributed as you get to low flows during droughts. Um, I was just curious if now, like you're saying, you know, we haven't had a drought that bad in a long time. You know, the the the, sh the hurt may be associated with intense precipitation. Is there a you know? We like, we let's actually say crossed the drought watch line last summer. So, I mean, it's... I mean, I'm not, yeah, yeah. of course, not as possible, right? But I'm just wondering if the, if there's a plan in place to control what happens during extreme precipitation. Because, I mean, if New York City lets a lot of water out of the, you know, that, that's going to cause downstream flooding. Right, so, right. There, is there a plan in place for, I, I question for either of you, actually, if, you know, for what to do during high flows as opposed yeah. to just low flows? Um, for, for the uh, reservoirs, there are, and you can, you can jump in, that one of the problems is there are two different types of reservoirs. And you have the Corps of Engineers flood control reservoirs that have huge gates. So they see a storm coming, you know, say five days out. They can open those gates and really pull the amount of water down pretty fast. In a drinking water system, uh, most of the water is going to the city, so the releases both to the city and to the river are pretty small pipes. So they'd have to know like a month before to get a, what, a 10 or 20 percent void in that reservoir. So it's, it's not as manageable. What the city had agreed to, which is, is really great for a water supplier, is that they try and maintain a 10 percent void in the reservoirs. Um, and you know, if you get two storms, what normally floods the Delaware is two storms, one after the other. One fills the reservoirs and one spills the reservoirs and, you know, fills all the, the tributaries too. But, um, so any, any water supplier wants to have 
the reservoir as full as possible on June 1st. That's, you know, when things, you know, they expect the rain to stop uh, being as intense, you know, during the summers you want it full. So the fact that New York is willing to have this graduated program to allow some um, voids in the reservoir um, is, is a lot to ask of me, you know, to do that. Mm -hmm. That's a good answer. <laughs> but I mean, in terms of adaptation strategies, it seems that, um, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I mean, you know, if you, the effort that would go into building an additional pipe that could be yeah, used to, yeah, to siphon, drain. Yeah, that's been suggested. Seems like something that, that could be done that would, re, would reduce damages by billions of dollars, no? It, it has been suggested. I know. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know too much about that. Um, I'm just curious. I mean, yeah. it seems like something that could, yeah. I mean, because it's, it's, it's a discrete investment in certain reservoirs is what you're saying. But, but it, was, it was interesting because during these storms, a lot of people pointed to the New York City reservoirs as the reason they got flooded. <laughs> New York City opened those gates and released that water when they shouldn't have, and that's why they flooded. It wasn't that there was 15 inches of rain in the upper basin. <laughs> so, um, actually the states put money into doing a model, uh, and uh, GS was the lead on the model, but the Corps was involved too, looking at if there were, if the reservoirs were totally empty, there was a 20% void, a 10% void, or full, what difference would it have made? And of course the answer is gray, right? Down by Trenton, it wouldn't have made that much difference. In the pinch point of Easton, it does make a difference. Mm -hmm. And of course, the closer you get to the reservoir, it makes makes a difference. But it's it was not the smoking gun. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, you probably remember that newspaper article where the lady in one of those condos spoke of the selfish people of New York City. Would you like to see my scars? <laughs> uh, well, they do have a yeah, those selfish right? people, 8 million or so, who wanted some drinking water coming out of their taps versus those people living in the river. Well, and that's why, you know, it's, it's a people thing. Um, you know, how do we help people understand that, one, they love the river, and one of the reasons they love it is there are no dams on the river. It's a beautiful river, but, you know, if it gets angry, things happen, and so uh, maybe you don't want to live that close to the river. I can't tell you how many times my neck has been sewn back on when I said, flood plains flood. <laughs> I live in a flood plain. It's like, oh, okay, well, sorry. <laughs> yes? I understand the importance of getting people to understand that, but I think more important maybe getting developers to yes. understand that. Well, I, I consider them to regulators. Yeah. Right? Regulators. Yes. Um, so, yeah, but there are two paths there. Yeah, right? no. A developer's motivation is not like to preserve the river and keep buildings out of the floodplain. A developer's motivation is usually building something that will cost a lot of money. Right. Well, and it's really, it's, it's the township right. officials. Right. right. Because they need revenues. They have friends, you know, people want to live near the river, they don't want to tell people they can't live near the river. You know, they, they, they list the FEMA requirements for, for elevations, but nothing more. And um, it's, I think you've got to do it economically and show townships that the amount of money you put out when, you know, the storm hits um, is not worth allowing people to live there. But you go up the river now, um, you know, from uh, uh, Georgia, Washington Crossing on up, right. the amount of new homes or retrofitted homes still between the canal and the river. Right. <laughs> yeah. when, just a, a note on that, Carol. Uh, when we did our, our floodplain maps, we produced them in 2006. Uh, it took until 2011, 2012, before FEMA released them. And in the meantime, I won't mention, I won't name the, the uh, township in the Penny Pack <laughs> that refused to let us uh, release the maps for their portion of the watershed 
because they had a development that was going, a multi-million dollar development that was going in, not in the floodplain, but actually in the channel <laughs> of the Pennypack Creek. And, you know, that's when I just threw up my hands and said, I'm, I'm out of here. Oh, when in Port Jervis, major, major air part of the city was underwater, um, FEMA came in and redid the floodplain maps. They were so friggin' mad because now their house was further in the floodplain, if, or maybe they were just out of it, and now they're in the floodplain. How am I going to sell my house? What do I do? But <laughs> it's... And they had to pay a higher premium for yeah, their flood insurance. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I guess a comment. Now, I'll put on my, um, I'm a township planner also. Lower Marion Township fronts on the Schuylkill River. Um, so, you know, yes, you can point the figure at developers, but developers are doing something because people want to buy that land, and people own that land, and they feel they have some sort of right to use that land. So there's a tension here between the public good and private rights that, you know, there's, there's some stuff on both sides. A. B, Pennsylvania, more than maybe any other state in the country, I think, is sort of pro-private rights. So it's very hard, historically, to impose some what we would call reasonable regulations in flood plains. And the last thing is specific. We've had a fight in Lower Marion for the last year over whether or not um, folks who illegally installed fences along their property lines in the floodplain. It was illegal whether or not we can force them to take them out. The problem with the fence in the flood line is that it stops things and it can you know, become a public health hazard. Because the combination of politics and case law it's very hard just to get those people to remedy their illegal action. Yeah. And Lower Marion is pretty progressive compared to yep. a lot of townships. Good. So I have a bit of a philosophical question, so it's going to be badly articulated. But, <laughs> you know, both of you talk about extreme events, and yet public policy is aimed at a very narrow norm. So how do we start to think influence public policy to actually recognize these more extreme events. Tell me what you mean by public policy that is more on norms. Well, look at Green City Clean Waters, right? For example, if you're you know looking at a sort of reduction of a you know one or two year you know storm, but many people flood in the ten year storms, mm -hmm. and we're not even getting up to the hundred year, two hundred year, five hundred year that we're seeing with more frequency. So how do we get? How do we begin to actually influence public policy to take to really recognize these more extreme events as public policy? I think Alan has an answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, talk to Carol. I mean, some of it, I think, comes down to. Like, I'm just thinking about the the Clean Water Act and the reason that you know the Philadelphia and New York green infrastructure plans are based on that are because we're trying to comply with the Clean Water Act, which is designed to protect water quality um, and not necessarily a holistic framework for managing water quality, flooding, etc. And so some of it comes back to, well, are we going to revise the Clean Water Act or, uh, you know, it's a silo or thing revisit again. that? And yeah. it's, it's, it's probably not going to happen anytime soon, and if anything, we might want to try to avoid that, <laughs> um, especially in this, at this point in time. And so for, for us, I think it's about, you know, integrated water management for us means um, coming up with a plan that, that balances. The flexible um, management plans is a great example. It's, it's a plan that balances multiple factors, and then the parties can come to the table and agree to that while still you know, meeting the regulations, but also balancing these other factors. That's the sort of thing we need to start doing more of, um, like on the on the on the green infrastructure side and on the stormwater management side. Um, so much of our money right now is going into combined sewer overflow and uh, improving water quality in you know smaller and smaller parts of, of New York Harbor um, for more and more money. And if we can put together you know an approach that you know can clean up our 
uh, a, a harbor and reduce flooding and you know you kind of looking for this magic yeah, bullet that uh, these multi-purpose solutions that can meet the regulations while also achieving all these other objectives. I think it's the the onus is on the um, municipalities and on the utilities to come up with a better plan mm -hmm. rather than like revisit this the Clean Water Act at this point. I think you know in, in some place like the Delaware that has a commission. I mean, you, you could elevate that to a more basin level. One of the problems I hear, and maybe Philadelphia can help me with this, Julia, that it's, I don't know if it's illegal or you, you're not supposed to use your user fees outside your jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, how, how can you work, do a lot of work upstream when it's not within Philadelphia boundaries is what I have heard. And so that limits things. But can I, I mean, this ties into a question that I was going to ask. I mean, so like New York City's Watershed Protection Plan is globally known, right, as a filtration avoidance and protected all this land in upstate. And right over here, I mean, we have Fairmont Park, which is Philadelphia's historic version of the same thing. So there's a precedent for doing that, right, where money is spent outside. But, you know, to go to your question with all the forest, why aren't we doing this, you know, with, in the exception of these like these specific cases, like New York City in this geographic area where it gets its drinking water, why aren't we thinking like on a basin scale um, about those types of you know upstream investments based on downstream interests? Yeah. I mean, what what, what like, this is what I'm so it's not that we we can't say that it hasn't been done and it hasn't been done with great financial savings for a city yeah. like Philadelphia. Why aren't we doing it at a larger scale? I think it's it's a, not. Not everything is illegal. It's a legal thing. It's very easy, I think, for a for a government entity to go buy land. That's what New York City did way back when. That's what Fairmont Park is. They own it. It's very different when you're taking money that's generated by a tax or as part of a program. Then you've got these sort of constraints. I think that's. Yeah. I think that's it. Well, we we've looked. I mean, DRBC looked into trying to develop a watershed fund. And through the William Penn project also, there was uh, working with uh, University of Maryland's environmental economic, whatever, looking at could you have a fund that you know was was paid into, you know, by counties, by households, you know, di different ways, but then it could be allocated for the best use for the for the commons, like buying forests. It's there's a pilot project down in the um, Brandywine Christina. But otherwise, from a basin-wide perspective, it was it didn't get anywhere. I think we've had a lot of success, though. I'm just thinking of this Google Action Network, which I used to be involved in. And that's our biggest trip you know, in the Delaware Basin. And they've been really successful as a network to make sure that our downstream interests in Philadelphia are being acknowledged upstream. There's all kind of subcommittees in that work group dealing with acid mine drainage or agricultural runoff, um, stormwater issues. So I think that we have some models, like just the school goal is the one that jumps to my mind, but it can be done when you're dealing with you mm -hmm. know, tons of different stakeholders and interests. It's and there is some money good. money available for, for projects, right. which makes a difference. Right. Yeah. You and any online questions? Okay, well, let's thank uh, both of our speakers.